Hello and welcome again to another edition of Inside Family Court. My name's Bill Tingley. My guest today is newly appointed Judge Stephen George of uh, the Family Court Division Number 9. Judge George, thanks for being here today. Thanks for the invitation. As you know, our, our topic today is uh, interstate law as it regards family law issues. I, before we started the show, I think I was telling you, a lady came up to me, a viewer, about a month ago in the mall and got talking to me about how uh, her daughter and son-in-law were getting a divorce and some, one of them ran off across straight lines with someone else and she asked me, why don't we do a show talking about that? So that's what we're here to talk about today. Appreciate your participation. I think we, we start off talking about uh, just straight up divorces, that is the court's uh, ability or authority to, to terminate the marriage. Do both parties necessarily need to live in the state of Kentucky for you to divorce them? Uh, no, they do not, Bill. Uh, the statute requires that one party be a resident of Kentucky for at least 180 days before the petition is filed. And that requires only one party, not both parties. If uh, one party resides outside the state of Kentucky, uh, there are a couple of different ways in getting uh, jurisdiction over that person for purposes of granting a divorce. There are a lot of different issues. Uh, there are issues of custody. Uh, there are issues of payment of child support. There are issues of division of property. And all of those are generally governed by uh, different statutes that require personal service or um, a constructive service in order to grant uh, a divorce and have jurisdiction over the subject matter. I think it's one, one of the things that, that uh, a lot of folks don't realize is that really when you get into uh, a divorce or dissolution proceeding, you're really, uh, as you say, when you start bringing up issues of custody, issues of child support, issues of division of property, what you really have are almost many trials within trials or many issues within issues. The, the jurisdiction that might allow you to grant a divorce uh, may not also allow you to make a custody determination. That's right. In any divorce case, you basically have issues of custody, visitation or parenting schedule, uh, child support, maintenance, division of property, restoration of non-marital property, and attorney's fees. And no matter how much people may own or, or whether they have children or how little they may own, you almost always face the same issues. Uh, some of them may be significant assets, some of them may be um, assets where the parties have already been, uh, divided those uh, to their mutual satisfaction, but those issues are there and, it, and there are different uh, ways uh, of the court assuming jurisdiction and sometimes the court has jurisdiction and sometimes the court does not have jurisdiction over those matters. And let's be clear, when we talk about jurisdiction, we're really talking about the, the lawful right of the court to take action, are we not? Yes, the power of the court to enter an order uh, over people. For example, uh, I, I, I tell clients that being living in Jefferson County and uh, being across the river in Indiana, uh, it's just uh, a short distance across that bridge, but sometimes it can be, uh, it is much more complicated than going across the river. It, uh, our court has no jurisdiction, for example, in many cases to issue orders that might affect people who are living in Indiana and who have not been served in Indiana. But, but in custody cases and other cases, oftentimes we have authority over those people because the children reside here. Let's talk, and I want to come back and talk in more detail about custody, but, but let's talk about uh, uh, child support orders, something that, that uh, we know there are a lot of out there. Uh, and let's assume for, for our situation that uh, I'm living here in Kentucky, uh, I'm the payor, uh, my child is uh, with uh, his or her mother uh, living in Ohio. Uh, does that present an insurmountable problem uh, for her to get child support for me or, or for that process to work? Uh, certainly it's not insurmountable. Uh, the easiest uh, way to do it uh, is for, uh, I think, for the mother uh, to come to Kentucky and sue you where you are. 
but that can be a little expensive. Uh, there are also federal statutes that allow for the collection of child support and the establishment of child support across state lines. Uh, so that, for example, uh, the mother in Ohio would go to her court, uh, contact uh, the, the county attorney, for example, in Ohio, establish, uh, initiate a proceeding there. They would send it to the county attorney here, and child support can be enforced or established across state lines in that regard. You're talking about the uh, Uniform Interstate Family Support Act, I yes. think, that, that uh, replaced uh, our ERISA, which replaced ERISA, yes. uh, the federal government's never-ending attempt to try to, to facilitate this. Yeah, uh, and, and if I can just ex uh, a little bit expand on that. Uh, divorce and family law is state law, uh, and that can be very difficult when you cross state lines. And uh, because of the problems that, uh, that uh, many have had in collecting child support, we've gotten uh, some federal intervention, and we've tried to adopt uniform laws uh, a law that Kentucky would adopt and Indiana would adopt and Ohio would adopt uh, and all of that generally is pursuant to some federal legislation that tells us if we want some federal money we have to adopt these laws but uh, they help to make uh, almost a national law out of a state process and it's really been beneficial it's helped people a lot in collection of in establishment of child support and collection of child support and, and along that same line, of course, part and parcel of a child support order is often uh, a wage assignment order. Uh, has that also been federalized, if you will? It sure has. And, and uh, I practiced and have practiced family law for more than 23 years before Governor Patton appointed me to the bench. And uh, I have seen huge changes over those 23 years uh, with wage assignments. They used to be uh, evidence that somebody was a deadbeat dad or a deadbeat mom not doing and fulfilling their obligation. Uh, their uniform now, their routine now, there's no uh, effect from the employer or there's not supposed to be any effect from the employer uh, for that, uh, for the, uh, uh, the court uh, establishing a wage assignment order. It is not evidence that you have not paid your child support. Important it's, distinction. Right? Yes, it's not a garnishment. It's right. not collection of a failure to pay child support. It is an assignment of wages uh, uh, for current and sometimes arrearages if those exist. Thank you, Judge. When we come back from break, let's talk about that uh, kidnapping out of Georgia. Okay. Thanks. Welcome back. Judge, I think when we left off, we were talking about my, my lady who, who approached me in the mall in the, in the Georgia case. Uh, talk to us, if you will, about custody and kidnapping and, and how the courts view that and the laws in that area. Well, in order for a court to uh, have jurisdiction to award custody, the child has to reside in the state of Kentucky for the past six months or 180 days for this court to have jurisdiction. Once this court uh, asserts jurisdiction, then uh, other states will acknowledge the jurisdiction that we have. Uh, all of the states in the United States have adopted the Uniform Child Custody and Jurisdiction Act, which states that the home state of the child is, this, is the place where the child has resided. Now, there Go are ahead. other circumstances when uh, this court can assume jurisdiction if the child uh, is endangered and is in this state, this court can assume jurisdiction as well. But unfortunately, this is something that, that happens on not an, not an infrequent basis. Uh, and as I understand the statute, in this case, it, when we talk about the home state of the child, it is not necessary for uh, a divorce or a custody proceeding to be necessarily filed for a court to recognize another state is, is actually the home state of the child. Am I, am I correct in that regard? Yes, that's correct. If the child is here, then we have jurisdiction to award uh, a parent or a, a non-parent under unusual circumstances custody uh, of that child. Uh, but if the child's not here, we really do not have jurisdiction over that child. Not here and, and hasn't been here. Not here you know, and hasn't been here. I've run across, you know, there's going to be a big ugly divorce in, in uh, Indiana. I don't like the judge there. Uh, I'm going to lose all over the place, so I snatch up the child, come over here, I file it, it shows up in your court. doesn't necessarily mean 
you're going to be able to hear that case. That's correct. And, and the goal of the U Uniform Child Custody and Jurisdiction Act, which is really a civil act, and again, it's one of those acts that we talked about earlier where Congress has kind of gotten people to act the enact the same act. Um, the goal is, for example, in, in, your, in your fact situation, for me to call the judge in Indiana and say, are you going to hear this case or am I going to hear this case? Mm -hmm. And for me to decline jurisdiction if uh, Indiana is the home state of the child. Uh, you cannot uh, be haven for people who uh, want to circumvent the law. It has happened in days gone by, though, hasn't it? Absolutely, it happens. Uh, everybody will try to get some advantage. Right. Uh, and, but you're required to state in your divorce petition um, whether any other state has jurisdiction mm -hmm. and whether any other actions have been filed. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we trust that we people will be honest. They're not always, but, but we trust they'll be honest when they sign those papers under oath. You and I both practice for a while now. I can't think of, of any other type of case where the law instructs the judge of one state to just pick up a telephone and call the, the judge of another state and have this kind of dialogue, can you? Uh, no, and it's really unusual, but you know, when you award custody, you're supposed to do that which is in the best interest of the child, and, and if that's the underlying concern, if that's the prevailing reason for the statute, then uh, it's pretty simple to avoid disputes because uh, you know, if you don't have both parties present before a judge, then I will hear testimony, for example, that might be totally opposite from the testimony mm -hmm. that the Indiana judge mm -hmm. will hear. And he'll make one decision and I would make another decision. That's mm -hmm. obviously inconsistent. And uh, that's certainly not in the child's best interest. Well, and, and in fact, there's, there's probably other information you'd like to hear from, like school teachers and babysitters and other parties that would have relevant information that may be sitting in Minnesota where the child has spent the last 10 years. And that's the reason. I mean, I mean six months is not a long time, but uh, we do move around a lot in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but at least for the previous six months, we could find out from babysitters, we can find out from counselors at school or school teachers or uh, preachers or whatever uh, uh, that have some contact with the children. That, those are the people the court wants to hear from. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the people that saw the interaction between the child and the parents before the litigation, before anybody was planning the litigation. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why it's important to be, uh, for the litigation to be close to those people. Mm -hmm. they've really, there's really power in the uniformity of the laws between the states in the, this area, isn't there? Yes, and, and it's uh, critical. Uh, the cooperation is critical. There's also, uh, I know you're aware of, the, the Hague Convention. Uh, if you could just give us a brief thumbnail of, of what that is. Well, I think a lot of people are aware that, that the Constitution in this country requires the states to give full faith and credit to the uh, laws of the other states. And in a sense, the Hague Convention is something like that on an international scale. The people who signed off, the countries, I should say, that signed off on the Hague Convention uh, treaty, they have agreed to uh, acknowledge the laws of the other countries. And if the United States has a hearing and we award custody pursuant to the terms of that hearing and we have jurisdiction uh, to issue that order, then other countries are obligated, if they've signed off on the Hague Convention Treaty, they're obligated to follow our rulings. Uh, what would be your, your best advice to, to a viewer who may be watching and may be confronted with an issue where a parent has fled with a child uh, to another custody, or I'm sorry, to another country. Is this the type of thing they should be handling them, trying to handle themselves? No, these are very complicated and uh, uh, technical uh, statutes, uh, international laws. Uh, clearly they need someone who has some experience. Uh, there are a lot of very good divorce practitioners uh, in this jurisdiction uh, who've had experience in international uh, disputes and I would look for someone who has some experience in an international dispute. Very good. When we come back from our next break, uh, let's talk about paternity cases and domestic violence. Okay. Good. Thanks. Welcome back. Uh, Judge George, let's talk about uh, paternity cases. Uh, 
Um, these are cases, of course, where the parties were never married, uh, but they have uh, a child in common, uh, and it's not unusual, and, and perhaps more common than even in divorce cases, to have uh, a parent in a different state. Uh, what's available for the parent here locally? They're going to have to travel to Texas to get the job done? No, they're not. Uh, this court can assume jurisdiction uh, over paternity action uh, if um, the act uh, occurred in this state. Uh, obviously, if the parties are in this state, we can serve the parties. There has to be personal service or service through the Secretary of State via the long arm statute, what we call the long arm statute, which means that it can be sent uh, by certified mail or through the Secretary of State. So if, if a person finds himself in this situation, uh, and here again I think we're back under the, uh, the UIFSA statute, uh, Uniform Interstate Family Support Act, who, what agency of the county tends to handle those actions? Well, the county attorney's office uh, prosecutes probably more than 99% of those cases, and those services are available uh, without charge to the, to the mother. So uh, the best advice would be to contact the county attorney's office here, uh, their offices on Muhammad Ali Boulevard, and uh, make an appointment, go in, see a worker, and uh, start the process for filing the petition. Then, then if uh, the father or putative father is out of state, then uh, it'll be sent to the home state where he resides and the county in which he resides He'll be served that way, be called in. He'll be responding in his state, and the mother will be uh, moving forward in this state, and the states coordinate those efforts in order to get the case to a judgment uh, of uh, paternity. You know, we have the DNA testing now that's uh, quite reliable, mm -hmm. and um, once those tests have been done, and they can be done from with the mother in this state and the father mm -hmm. in a different state. Mm -hmm. Uh, and once those are done, then uh, the child support can be established according to guidelines. The process is really, uh, you and I both have kind of watched, I think, this process steadily improve uh, over the years, back from the days when it was Eurisa and, and all the difficulties there. Yes, it's, uh, uh, it's just much more efficient than it used to be. The goal is uh, to establish paternity. Uh, it's much more accurate now with the DNA testing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not trying to stick people uh, for paying child support if they're not the father. Mm -hmm. It can be readily ascertained. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say that uh, uh, one thing that's come to my attention in the uh, three months that I've been on the bench is that a lot of people, uh, and not necessarily in interstate cases, but in paternity cases, will admit th that they're the father, mm -hmm. and then they'll come back later and say, oh, I'm not, and I want a DNA test. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a judgment. Uh, the rules require a very specific uh, affidavits in, in support of a motion to set aside the judgment. Mm -hmm. And um, it's probably something uh, like many of these aspects uh, where they should employ an attorney to represent them to challenge something mm -hmm. like that. But the situation is just so much more efficient uh, mm -hmm. than it used to be. The only problem right now just continues to be volume, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's a huge volume. Um, I'll probably have uh, 35 to 60 cases a week mm -hmm. on my paternity docket, and I have uh, one-ninth, I guess, or one-eighth uh, of the paternity cases mm -hmm. in Jefferson County. In the same vein, you find yourself handling cases which have been filed by other states. Yes, yes, uh, in the same process where uh, the mother may be living out of state, the father's living in this state, and uh, you know, it t to, to calculate child support uh, is a uh, really a, a mathematical calculation under guidelines uh, that all states have adopted. All states have uh, child support charts. Uh, again, that's one of those things manda mandated by uh, Congress. Uh, if you want some federal money, uh, you have to adopt a, a chart. Now, all the states have uh, different charts, but they're all within the same range. Mm -hmm. Some are on gross income, as ours is. Some are on net income, but they're all within the same range. Let's shift to an issue which, uh, 
as all these issues, you know, are a deep concern to a lot of people, and that is the issue of domestic violence. Uh, cases, especially with uh, our state and our city that finds ourselves, you know, right across the river from another state, uh, an act of domestic violence is committed uh, here in Kentucky, uh, and the person who perpetrated the act, you know, lives in Indiana or moves over to Indiana. Uh, what, if any, interstate uh, relief is available for the victim? Well, uh, if you're a resident of Kentucky, no matter how long you've resided in Kentucky, uh, or if you have fled to Kentucky to avoid uh, a, a situation of domestic violence, mm -hmm. and you're in Kentucky now, uh, then Kentucky has jurisdiction to issue a protective order. Uh, a, what will generally happen uh, is that uh, a copy of that order will be sent to the uh, process office, sheriff, whatever, police mm -hmm. in Indiana, the county in which the perpet alleged perpetrator resides, uh, and he will be served, and he will be served to appear in Jefferson County. And if he f has been served, and if he fails to appear, then the proof will be presented by uh, the moving party, the petitioner, and uh, based on that proof, uh, the court has the authority to execute uh, or enter a domestic violence order, mm -hmm. and once that order is entered, it will be registered, mm -hmm. uh, nationally my, registered. Pardon me. My understanding uh, is that, that here within the last uh, two years, we've also enacted statutes which allow uh, domestic violence orders or protective orders issued out of other states uh, to be registered here uh, for enforcement purposes. That's right. And, and really, it's not just, it, it certainly is domestic violence, but it's not just domestic violence. If you've got a, a couple or a party who was divorced in a different state and one of them moves with a child to Kentucky, you can register those divorce papers mm -hmm. in Kentucky uh, and uh, uh, move for protection or modification of those or whatever in Kentucky. Uh, we're trying to make it easier because we know how mobile a society we mm -hmm. are. We're trying to make it easier to enforce court orders out of other states because we have an obligation to give full faith and credit to the laws and the judgments mm -hmm. of those other states. We're getting out, about out of time, but let's talk just very quickly about uh, orders of contempt uh, or arrest warrants for non-payment of uh, child support. You know, how does that work? You know, I, I didn't show up. You found me in contempt, and I've left the state. Uh, am I am I gone and safe? Not necessarily. Uh, the contempt power of the court might be the most powerful uh, tool that a judge has. If a judge believes that a party has willfully and flagrantly violated its orders, uh, then the court has the authority, without impaneling a jury, to impose a sentence of up to 180 days. And those, again, can be registered with law enforcement agencies. Uh, uh, warrants for arrest can be issued. And uh, if those warrants are issued, uh, then they'll go to the police and to the national uh, computers. And uh, somebody might get picked up um, in California for a traffic ticket and be pulled over and may have uh, those warrants outstanding for them, and depending on the complexity of the case, may be uh, extradited to Kentucky. Judge, thanks for your time. My pleasure. Welcome to Family Court. Thank you. It's a Glad thrill to be here. here. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.